And welcome to a new edition of Haunted Hotels. My name is Sam Baltrusis, and I'm an author and journalist. Joining me is the lovely Alec Matsuo. Welcome to the show, Alex. Hey, thanks for having me, Sam. So, Alex, I always bring this up every time we talk, but you are the first person to interview me on a radio show years ago. And so, how have I mean? Like that whole like being the first person that I that I talked to on the radio, like how is it weird kind of seeing it like how we've both kind of blossomed our careers blossomed since then? Yeah, because I think when did I interview you? Was that a uh, 2013, 2012? Like 2012, yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of crazy how like how much our lives have changed since then, and how much we have both like yeah, like you said, blossomed and grown in the paranormal community. It's it's really it's really interesting <laughs> to see how like how the how the progression has happened, which is awesome. So Alex, so looking back at your your career, and I have to say you are my go-to person when it comes to sort of like the paranormal pop culture. Also, when it comes to some of the most haunted hotels in California, and you have a whole backstory having worked in, or lived in California, growing up in California. Yeah, oh yeah, um, I mean, I, didn't move to the East Coast until 2013. So I think until I was 27, I lived in San Diego. Uh, I mean, I flip-flopped between San Diego and LA because, you know, I was an aspiring actor and, you know, getting work and stuff up and down uh, the Southern California coast. So I was traveling to LA a lot. So, yeah. All right, so I'm actually about to go to Los Angeles in a few weeks. And I wanted to stay, I'm going to stay at the Hotel Roosevelt. I know you have this amazing story because I saw it on your TikTok and and, uh, your YouTube channel uh, for the spooky stuff. So tell us about your experience at the Hotel Roosevelt. Yeah, so I was working for somebody at the time and they were staying at the Roosevelt Hotel for um, quite a while. And actually, that wasn't even the first, first time I was at the Roosevelt. Uh, It just kind of happened um the first time i stayed at the roosevelt was in 2012 um and that was literally like you remember back when hotwire did like the the secret hotel bookings like you book a hotel you know for like a super cheap price but you didn't know where it was going to be (laughs) (laughs) and so it was like okay well this could either be a comfort inn or it's going to be like a, a, a a marriott you know you just don't know and uh my friend and I got a really good deal on this hotel and I was like, Oh, it's on Hollywood Boulevard. And now granted, if you're familiar with LA, a hotel on Hollywood Boulevard doesn't mean a lot. (laughs) Doesn't mean much. (laughs) I always say some of the bravest things I ever did was walking barefoot on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, (laughs) cause my, one of my shoes broke, but, uh, yeah. So we booked the hotel and it turned out to be the Roosevelt. And I was like, Oh, okay that's that's cool that's fancy uh because it is fancy i mean celebrity stay at the roosevelt hotel there's a lot of uh a lot of stuff happening there and it's right across uh the street from the chinese theater grauman's chinese theater um i think madame tussauds is like maybe down the street from there um there's a lot happening in that particular spot um in hollywood so we really felt like we were in like the know and stuff, which is cool. Uh, so, and even on that, and even on that trip, we had a few weird things happen. And, you know, at that point I was into the paranormal. So I was like, okay, well, let's look up the ghost stories. And I had read about Marilyn Monroe's ghost. And, um, there was, there was a lot happening there paranormally, you know, and, so I really wanted to explore that a bit, although we didn't really ever do an, ofi- an official investigation there, which, you know, definitely, I think, Sam, if you go there, you definitely need to do that. Because um, I've stayed in many different rooms in the Roosevelt. I mean, I never stayed in the same room twice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's it's definitely something, it's definitely something to to really explore because you know i mean i guess if you want to meet a celebrity um if you want to meet a celebrity you know if you want to meet marilyn monroe or um gosh there's so many celebrities that uh that oh, are Montgomery here. Clef too, right isn't there like yeah. monty Clef is supposedly monty haunts that location there. um there's a ghost by the name of caroline there carolyn caroline uh there's there's a lot there's a lot going on there um 
But yeah, I mean, as soon as I walked through those doors at the Roosevelt, um, the first time I ever went there, I just felt, felt, I felt weird. Like I'm not a medium. I'm not psychic. I don't have gifts, although some people say I do, but if I do, they're, I'm not trained. <laughs> I'm not trained. So I just got this really like overwhelming, like odd feeling about it. Um, 2011 was the first time I ever stepped into the Roosevelt. 2012 was the first time I stayed there. So I, I God, 10 years now. Holy cow. Where'd the time go? Um, now Hollywood has the energy of itself. Um, I, I've said it a few times throughout anytime I've talked about Hollywood, there's a weird energy with Hollywood. I'm oddly drawn to it. Like I can't get enough of Hollywood. Um, I love it. But um, yeah, so, so the first time I stayed there, I still got hit with that weirdly, really weird feeling. And then um, I kept seeing shadows out of the corner of my eye. Like, you know, like constantly like somebody's like there and I'm like, looking around. Um, and I, and I was also thinking like, okay, well maybe my brain is seeing something, but it's filling in the void with shadows. Like maybe there's somebody standing there. Um, it was, uh, it was, um, it was, it was odd. That was probably the first time I had really like consistently saw something out of the corner of my eye. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was, it was weird. And then of course, yeah, that's that's that that was like the first that was the first time I was like, okay, this hotel is weird. More than just a feeling this time, I'm seeing stuff. I'm seeing stuff. So the Hollywood Roosevelt uh, has the ghost of Marilyn Monroe, and guess what? I'm related to Norma Jean or Marilyn Monroe, and that's something that I've discovered. So I have multiple people that I'm related to. Apparently, my family is like has this bloody backstory. But you know, what are you? What are your thoughts on Marilyn Monroe? I mean, do you feel like that she? I mean, the part that that always kind of um, intrigues me with her story is the way she died. It's almost like it's very mysterious, and some people say that it may have been she may have been killed. What What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think the Kennedys were involved somehow. That's, that's me putting, that's like, well, I, I'm rarely a tinfoil hat conspiracy theory person. <laughs> rarely, like, I'm usually the one going like, oh, come on, y'all, come on. There's, there's better stuff than this. But with her and the way that she died, yeah, I, I honestly think the Kennedys had something to do with it. I'm not sure if it was because she was pregnant with Bobby Kennedy's baby. Um, I know that's one of the theories as to why, like, why the Kennedys would even care. I think it's kind of her story and Princess Diana's story are oddly eerily similar with that, with the way that they um, created connections and friendships with celebrities. I mean, with Marilyn Monroe, it made sense. Diana was kind of a different story. Um, but and that's Diana's another one. I'm like conspiracy theory too, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, I think with Marilyn Monroe, it's beautiful, beautifully tragic. Uh, it's a beautifully tragic story, and the I mean, her her story is like the classic rags to riches story too. I mean, she was gorgeous, um, gorgeous, and seemed to be fairly down to earth, and just had just some really rough cards dealt to, dealt to her and it seems like that the connections that she made throughout her life ended up contributing to her demise so so in regards to her her childhood and her lineage so the whole idea is um so she, in her birth certificate um mortensen is the last name so the father was um Put, up, put on the birth certificate. However, based on what people suspect, that her mother actually had an affair with a Mr. Gifford, which would make us related. So we may or may not really would like to find out is if we are in fact related, like who's Marilyn Monroe's daddy? You know, like who, like, who really is the father? And this, we suspect strongly that it is Mr. Gifford. And if that's the case, then she and I are related. And she's also related to Lizzie Borden. That's weird. You know, that's just that whole, it, it kind of makes you wonder, like, does bloodline contribute to these weird, crazy events that happen in somebody's life? I mean, Lizzie Borden, Marilyn, and then you, I know you also have lineage with um, Bish, the Bridget Bishop? Uh, they're the Putnam family. So Putnam. The, the bad guys, 
yeah, the Putnam Sea were the major accusers in the Salem Woods trials. And so, yeah, if you look at, at my lineage, it's stained with blood. It's like literally, it's tr like tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. Yeah. And right, yeah, we, I'm doing a show called The Curse of Lizzie Borden, and we didn't add Marilyn to it because we couldn't prove that she was in fact uh, related to us. But do you think that, what, do you believe in curses? You know, uh, I do. I do. Um, I, throughout my life, uh, I was kind of skeptical about it, but, um, but I've seen like history repeat itself with different generations of families, like, you know, things kind of repeating and starting over. Um, I even see that with my own relationship with my mother and trying to avoid being like my mother and then making choices with the same results that, you know, that led to my mother's like, you know, bad luck, so to speak. And I'm like, wait a minute, I tried everything that I could to avoid this destination and I still landed here regardless. Um, so I think, I think curses can be a thing or if it's, um, or if we want to try to explore it scientifically, I'm not a scientist, by the way, nobody Google me, please. You'll find a <laughs> master's in theater. That's it. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's, but there's that, uh, there's a theory that, you know, there's gen, I, I forgot what it's called, but it's like generational memory. Like it's the reason why I gain weight, even though I only eat a thousand calories a day, but it's because my ancestors starved during the potato famine and so, you know, gene wise, like my genes remember that. And so when I don't eat enough calories, it's like, oh, it's time to put some put uh, put some fat on those thighs and you'll survive any <laughs> potato famine. You know, so but I think there's something to that. Like if my DNA can determine like how I gain weight and um, how I maintain weight and all that stuff uh, and mental illness being passed down or diabetes being um, passed down, so to speak. I mean, I have a very, I have one of the rarest forms of diabetes where it's literally a generational thing. Like, because every woman in my, in, in my mother's side has had diabetes, including myself. And it's just predisposition for that. So I think if that, those things can be passed down through bloodlines, I mean, why not like certain habits or behaviors or even fates, you know? And so, like, so we have Lizzie Borden, who was acquitted of murdering her father and her stepmother, Abby Borden. And then we have um, Eileen Warnos is another one who who is a notorious ser serial killer in Florida uh, who's connected. Marilyn Monroe, who I would view more as a victim as opposed to a, a perpetrator. She's obviously not a murderer. But so we have murderers and victims. And also what's even fascinating about this lineage, including... And Putnam Jr., who was the major accuser, they're all women. So it's almost like the the curse is not skips the men and it, and it goes to all the women. And do you think that like the gen, like that could be like and you were saying about diabetes passing just to the women? Could the curse also just pass to the women in the family? I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, there's a lot of um, I mean, there's a lot of health issues that are passed down through the mothers. DNA um, through the through the the female um, whatever chromosome is tied to female. See, this is what I'm not a scientist. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think it's why. <laughs> I think it's why too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I I 100% think that there's something to that. Um, yeah, especially I mean, there's theories out there that abilities like mediumship abilities is passed through through the mother. So. It's interesting. It's, it's it's interesting when you think about that. So this is Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrusis, and I, I, I like to, you know, like also like, for, of course, focus on, on Haunted Hotels, but we're kind of briefly talking earlier before about some of the hotels that I've investigated, and it turns out that there are telltale signs that there were actually brothels, and that's just like, that's a bad segue, but have you encountered that too? I mean, like, were you, like, you're like, wait a minute, that's a brothel. Yeah, yeah, there, um, it wasn't in a hotel, so to speak, but it was in a museum um, up in Littleton, North Carolina, which is where I'm in North Carolina now. Very different from California. <laughs> and uh, this museum, it's a paranormal and cryptozoology museum. And, you know, you they are tracking like Bigfoot stuff and everything, but they also have a paranormal side to it. And it's a, it's a decent sized house. I mean, I would say it's like 2,500 square feet. I mean, it's a pretty big house. 
and there's a lot of bedrooms on the second floor and they're all kind of lined up like a hotel and <laughs> um the the owner of the of the museum who also owns the house he, he and his family live in the house uh, he was telling me how there's like little hook locks on each door in, in, in every room. And I'm like, that's interesting. You know, that's, you know, and granted Littleton was a stagecoach stop, but there's already a place for people to stop on the stagecoach. Like there was already, um, there's already a place for them to rest their head. It's called person's ordinary, um, literally just down the block, just five minute walk, not even five minutes. And, uh, and then he was telling me, you know, when they bought the house and they were looking through the attic, they found like a pair of vintage stockings, like from the 1800s. And I'm like, stockings, locks on the doors. Hmm. <laughs> I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. And he was telling me, um, I forgot to mention this earlier. He was telling me about how, you know, the, he, they would see apparitions of women like scantily clad women around um on the second floor and uh a, a couple mediums picked up on the spirit of a little boy who was like the son of one of the women who lived there and I was like okay okay so there's a theory because especially since that stagecoach stop was just right down the block you know park your stagecoach get your room for the night and head up head head up the street to visit some local women you know <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And anytime I had a medium go in there, you know, because I went to that museum a lot because, you know, haunted, it was, it's haunted. Um, haven't officially investigated it yet, but it's a good place to just visit people. Um, but anytime I had a medium go in there, she'd walk around and then she kind of looks, she always looks at me with like a grin, like, where'd you bring it to? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. My, so my, um, my location is Orleans Waterfront End in Cape Cod. And, it, you know, it, it's, it had sort of like a, a, a shady past. There was a lot of gambling going on, um, illicit things are going on. And then, of course, there's prostitution. So it was a house of ill repute. And, I, and it's funny, I'm like, why do I always end up at the brothels? I mean, it's almost like I'm getting, getting called to them. But I also find that women gravitate, women's spirits gravitate toward me. And, and as someone that investigates, and I know you're not clairvoyant, but do you find that the women of like these locations, like women of the night or, or women who the working women uh, gravitate to you because you're a woman. You know, I've, I've run into that before. Um, I have a harder time connecting with male spirits, like um, cis hetero male spirits. I have a hard time connecting to, but I seem to have better luck with women um, as well as queer spirits um, as well as spirits with special needs. Uh, I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know why, uh, with the women, I can kind of see why. Cause it's like, Oh, it's another female, you know, we're safe. We're safe with her. Um, but, uh, but also spirits of color. I've connected with spirits of color. Um, like they seem more willing to talk to me. Um, which is a, which is why depending on where I'm going, I look at the dynamic of the people I'm bringing with me, you know, um, like, the, like trans Allegheny has I mean, it's, I'm not super happy with them right now for personal reasons. Uh, but, um, you know, if I were to go to Trans Allegheny, I would probably bring a lot of my um, my, my fellow queer investigators because Trans Allegheny has queer history uh, there. And I feel like that's one element of the par of the paranormal community that we haven't really quite explored that yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. So I definitely I see that um, I see that. But I've also noticed that the spirits that I connect with at these locations, I also connect with the living in the same dynamic. So, um, like, majority of my friends are women um, or uh, queer, <laughs> you know, uh, it's or both <laughs> or both um, or female identifying, too, because I, ha I, I have a I have a spirit that likes to hang out around here now who who's um a trans woman and you know she, i was like hey you know come come on over and hang out and stuff and it gets active in my bathroom when i'm doing my makeup and it's really that, that's a whole other story for another time <laughs> that's a new that's a new <laughs> one that popped up recently i don't know where i picked her up from but she can stay 
I, I also, so for me, like I, I have been told and I, and I feel this strongly is that spirits see me as a woman and I'm okay with that. Um, like uh, even like when you, when it, with the, the show, the curse of Lizzie Borden, I actually channel a woman and it's like, it's, it's almost like she kind of took me over and I, I felt okay with that. And I, and I, and it's one of those things that I think it takes a certain kind of person to be able to feel comfortable with their, uh, you know, with their gender and with their identity and that sort of thing to be able to do that. But I, I think it's an honor to be able to give women a voice, children a voice, people of color a voice. And I think that, and I get that from you too. I get that you're like, you're open to it. So people like us will go to locations and get a completely different reading on a location versus say uh, ghost adventures, going to a location and getting a, doing a, an investigation and who they talk to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's uh, that's a that's a good point. Um, I think, and maybe because I, I I I've been told by several people that I have a gift, and I'm like, if I have a gift, I'm doing really badly with it. <laughs> like, um, but then sometimes like I, I make a joke. It's like when the when the moon is lined up with Pluto in the right angle, and the sun's rays is pointing at this one tree in Washington. I, I I'm in tune. You know, like it never happens, but when it happens, it's it's oddly strange. And I noticed that with my um, new spirit that's hanging out around me. And like I said, I don't know where she came from. She just kind of popped up one day and I just got this feeling of like, okay, you're here. I don't know who you are, but let's talk. And so I just turned on my phasma box and I was like, okay, let's talk. <laughs> this is the only way I can hear you. So do your best. <laughs> So, so, yeah, Alex, so we're, so we're, we are doing a special promotion with my paranormal network. It is the 13 weeks of Halloween. So we're going to run a commercial about this great promotion, 13 weeks of Halloween. We'll, we'll be back after the break. And welcome back to Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrusis. I'm talking to the one, the only, Alex Matsuo. Welcome back to the show, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> so we're running this special Halloween promotion, and we're, I want to think about Halloween and Haunted Hotels and Halloween. What is your favorite Haunted Hotel Halloween-themed movie? Oh, uh, gosh. Okay. I am going to really date myself, but also it's going to show how maybe I don't have the best taste in movies. But if anyone watched the Disney Channel in the 90s, um, <laughs> they made a movie out of the Tower of Terror ride Ooh, at, yeah. Disney, at Disneyland, Disneyland's California Adventures. Um, so they made a made-for-TV movie. <laughs> For, on the Disney Channel, and it's basically the, the Tower of Terror. It's like the origin movie for Tower of Terror, and it starred Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's spooky. Um, that's probably my favorite one because uh, it definitely delved into the whole um, origin story of like the hotel and why it got abandoned and the broken elevator. And it's 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 a terrifying dropping ride. Like that that ride never ceases to terrify me and the one in florida is even scarier um the one in california is now the guardians of the galaxy ride they revamped it i was so mad when they did that um but yeah that's probably one of my favorites actually but but uh, i mean also i mean the shining that's you know who who doesn't like the shining um <laughs> that's a classic uh let's see um how about yeah. 14 1408's uh the john cusack movie Based on Stephen King's short story. Have you um, seen that? I haven't yet. That's on my list. I do this thing every October where I watch a horror movie every night. Um, it gets a little exhausting after like seven <laughs> days. But, but I try to watch a horror movie every night in October. And that's on my list this year. So... All right. So based on those movies and sort of like the pop culture representation, what what do you get from... So, I mean, for, like for the movie, like you mentioned the 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 elevator being haunted and kind of dropping like that's a kind of a common recurring motif at haunted hotels right like like the elevators opening and closing mysteriously yeah oh yeah even in the shining the elevator like you know the elevator opens and all that blood comes out and um yeah i mean it's it kind of reminds me of you know like haunted railroad tracks being you know haunted railroad tracks or uh uh streets um wagon trails you know having activity and energy and with i mean 
we could even kind of go into the whole Cecil Hotel thing with the Lisa Lamb and the elevator, that whole thing too. That's um, true. You know, elevators seem to have energy that's, it's repetitive, you know, it's repetitive and you have different people going into these elevators and there's a lot of energy happening in those, in those areas. That's, I mean, that's something I haven't even thought about that maybe because there's so much activity in the elevator, it's almost like uh, generating energy. It's so it's sort of like residual in nature. Yeah. There is a, ho there's another hotel in North Carolina. Um, they're not open to investigations. Uh, so if anyone looks them up, please don't tell them I sent you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the Brookstown Inn in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and uh, it was a cotton mill for several decades, and uh, the employees, uh, several of the female employees lived at, in the Brookstown Inn when it was a cotton mill, and two of the employees had gotten into a fight, and one of them pushed the other down the elevator shaft, and, you know, the part of the ghost story is you can hear her screaming in the elevator shaft, Um and that's spooky. That elevator is spooky. And the elevator shaft is spooky, too. Um, you know, it's it's owned by the Wyndham now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, gosh, even the Roosevelt, their, um, their elevators were kind of weird, too. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, we, that had some weird energy, too. Well, the Roosevelt's just weird. <laughs> for Like, for us, we have – and also there's haunted mirrors, too. So, like, the, the Roosevelt has – the Marilyn Monroe mirror, and I hear that they don't have that out anymore. And in Boston, there's a there's at the Parker House we have the Charles Dickens mirror, which is still on the mezzanine level. And so, so tell us, like, did you were you able to see the Marilyn Monroe mirror at the at the Roosevelt? Yeah, yeah, um, I, I actually saw it twice. Um, oh, I'm I'm sad that they might they might may have taken it down. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was able to see it. I had to, I had to go on Google to find it because it's like. I can't remember if it was by the elevators at the time, but it was definitely in like the lobby area and you had to like, someone had posted like a route to get there. Um, yeah, that one is, um, that one's a uh, pretty, pretty strange. It's, it's got a strange energy to it. And I know that's where, you know, apparitions of Maryland have been seen, um, especially in that mirror. Um, which makes me wonder, is that actually her or is it more of a residual thing? Because if I'm not mistaken, that mirror was originally in a penthouse at the Roosevelt by the pool that she was staying at. Because um, you have the main building and then they have these penthouses around the pool. Um, right. That's where she did her photo shoot and everything. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, although... The Roosevelt has a really, it, it's a weird energy, but it's not like a negative energy, if that makes sense. So, I mean, if I were to hang out someplace in my afterlife, I mean, I wouldn't it's mind like, going to the Roosevelt. Like by the pool at the, in the cabana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so with mirrors, like so the Charles Dickens mirror at the Parker House in Boston, the legend is if you say Charles Dickens three times, something weird will happen. And I, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, whatever. So I, I was, I would give a tour and I would be like Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens and the elevator would mysteriously open uh, on the mezzanine level. And then also I was uh, taking photos from my book, Ghost to Boston and the photographer who was kind of a skeptic, but not after we were, we were uh, filming together or taking photos together. So I was standing in front of the mirror and I'm like, Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens. And Ryan, the photographer, um, was taking my photo and he's like, Sam, Sam, look behind you. And there was like something inhaling and exhaling on the mirror right behind me in the mezzanine at the Parker House. So he actually, I mean, he's, he, he got kind of freaked out because it was like, like you can actually see someone breathing on the, on the mirror. And I'm like, this is just normal for me. Like, it's nothing. I just found it kind of fascinating, actually. And there may be something explainable when it comes to that. But I will say, I mean, what are your thoughts on mirrors? Like, do you think that there are portals to the other side? Mm, you know, I think it depends on the mirror and especially with how it's made. Um, and if you have, like, mirrors facing each other. I, and I know there's some things with feng shui, like, you don't want to have a mirror facing you when you're sleeping. Um, I had a mirror facing me for years when I was, um, you know, when I first moved to North Carolina. I have this huge wooden mirror. Um, hang on, my cat is meowing. I need to close the door. <laughs> Good thing we're pre-recorded. What's up, babies? Okay. 
All right. <laughs> I heard it. I was like, uh-oh. Um, yeah, so I think it has something to do with the, with the way the mirrors are made. Um, like, I have a big wooden mirror. I think it was probably made in, like, early 2000. And I had it facing my bed for years. Um, and oddly enough, those were some of my quieter years. Um, so, I'm, so I don't know. I think I know scrying mirrors can be pretty active. I actually almost bought one of Rosemary Ellen Guiley's scrying mirrors, and I regret I didn't do it now. Um, so I think there's something to it, but I do wonder if it has something to do with the way that the mirror is made. Um, cause I know the way that they made mirrors like 30, 40 years ago, a hundred years ago is really different from how they make mirrors now. So. Yeah. I tend to see more activity surrounding by more of the older mirrors, uh, as opposed to like I'm seeing a more, uh, re like a newer mirror that I encounter at a haunted hotel. Um, so while we were talking, you had a you had a cat encounter, um, and like uh, that's something that actually kind of reminded me of haunted hotels with animals and like haunted haunted cats. Have you ever like like seen an animal animal spirit at a haunted hotel or at, at a location? I haven't seen one, but I've experienced one. I was actually at the Farnsworth in Gettysburg. And uh, there's a kitty. There's a there's a ghost kitty uh, there. And when I heard the story, I was like, eh, OK, you know, that's 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 cool. But, you know, if there's a cat ghost, I'll be more than happy to see a cat ghost. And uh, me and Michelle Hamilton actually were doing the ghost tour together. And uh, I, I adore her to pieces. And uh, we had our equipment with us and people started to talk about we were in the dining room area and people started talking like, oh, I feel something brushing my leg, or I feel a little breeze by my legs. And and Michelle and I, like, cr we, we knelt down, and I had my K2 meter. And I had been testing this thing around, you know, finding where, like, the wiring is and everything. And um, the floor wasn't going off at all when I initially looked. But when someone said, oh, there's a cat, or the, I feel a cat, I was like, okay, this is my moment. <laughs> and Michelle and I both knelt down and I put my K2 down there and the K2 started going nuts. Um, it went absolutely nuts. And the more that I did like the kitty baby talk, I was like, oh, who's a cute little kitty? You know, <laughs> um, I'm a crazy cat lady, uh, you know, um, and Michelle's doing the same thing. And the, and the K2 meter was just going nuts. And uh, we're just like, oh, who's a good baby? You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, was, I was just like, okay, come here, kitty cats. <laughs> Let's do this. So, so this is the Farnsworth Worth House. Actually, I recently just stayed at the Farnsworth House. And I, I asked to be put into the non-haunted room. Uh, and I'm like, and they're like, oh, we'll, we'll put you in the Ginny Wade room. And I'm like, Wait, isn't that name kind of important? You know, <laughs> so it turns out it's very haunted. Uh, there, there was uh, so the, it's actually not in the main house, so that's mm -hmm. why they consider the room. It's by the garden, but I had uh, basically an encounter uh, while staying at the Farnsworth house in the Ginny Wade room. There was like a like a nurse, like a woman, a spirit that manifested in the room. She was kind of like this white mist that took the shape of a woman. And I felt very, very uh, welcome in that room. So it wasn't a negative haunting. It was actually a very positive haunting. Nice. I was going to say, I read Richard Estep's book on the Farnsworth. I'm pretty sure he had some experiences in the Jenny Wade room. Oh, he did? Okay. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, I've never stayed there. I've, I've done the ghost tour there, though, um, a few times. And, uh, yeah, that's that place is pretty pretty active. It's pretty active. And and also too like we um, so I actually was with Richard Estep and I I I should have read the entire book because I am like oh it's not haunted and so Richard uh, and I investigated in the basement area of the Farnsworth house and I'll tell you that was extremely active and there was a mirror in there too that that, that really kind of like which is kind of similar to the mirrors that we were talking about at, at the haunted hotels but I will say that 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 mirror is still there they said they got rid of the mirror but it's still down in the basement at the Farnsworth house. Yeah, didn't a I think Amy Allen said something like there's something attached to that mirror, if I remember correctly. But um, yeah, uh, Nikki, uh, Nikki and uh, Rob from Live Paranormal, they they investigate that basement quite a bit, and there's some weird stuff happening there. I mean, when I investigated it, 
there's some weird stuff happening. <laughs> so, uh, and that could be happening for a multitude of reasons. Um, there's, yeah, there's, I mean, Gettysburg, you throw a rock, you hit five ghosts. So, I mean, <laughs> 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 that's not even an exaggeration. I mean, any hotel that I, or any place that I've stayed in Gettysburg has been really haunted as well. Um, I mean, I've stayed at the 1863 Inn right next door to the Jenny Wade house. Like, here's the Jenny Wade house. Here's the 1863 Inn. It's right there. Um, you know, I've, I've stayed in, uh, I've stayed at, hang on, I got it. I have another cat that's meowing. Hey, Chloe, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. It's okay. I I um I love I love crazy cat ladies. They're they're my favorite. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Gettysburg to me was very was very active. Um, I think the reason why the the basement of the Farnsworth House is so active is it, it, I what I got from from uh, picking. I actually read the basement because I didn't know the whole backstory. But there was up there, so I think it served as sort of a temporary morgue at one yes. point. There was also like a tavern period that that had a layer to it um there was also a young boy that uh that i was picking up his my shirt was being tugged uh, right by the location that the door and the door leads out to the street where this young boy was killed by a, a stagecoach or by by a, a carriage and so i was picking up with this boy and a, and a sweet little boy uh, i think his name is william uh and i was picking up uh, his energy and it was just a, like such a a memorable investigation and i will say investigating with richard Estep is like he's so um, meticulous when it comes to paranormal investigating he's like like checking off everything i'm saying and he's like yep 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 and i'm like all right richard and he's like did i did i because I, I was reading the location like a like a clairvoyant or psychic and he's like you got 90 percent correct sam there was like one part that i'm like like if i got 90 percent, that's pretty darn good richard you know right right <laughs> So I was like seeing one thing after another. Another thing too that that, that mirror actually was um, was investigated or was uh, Lorraine Warren warned people about that mirror. So it actually goes back to Lorraine Warren, uh, who said that the that the mirror served as a portal uh, to the other side. And I think the person, the people that in, that investigated that mirror actually was uh, Amy and Adam from Kindred Spirits. So. They're the ones that did an investigation. I'm not sure if Amy Allen was there too, but I do know multiple shows have been to that location, the Farnsworth House and that mirror. But getting back to, to cats, because I love that topic, uh, ghost cats. So we have a lot of them in Salem. And we also have, uh, I had an experience at, at a hotel, at Orleans Waterfront Inn, and that was also a brothel too. So we could tie in all the themes. But um, I was staying in the haunted room, room, room five, and I felt something kind of like rub up against my leg. Uh, and I, I looked down and there was nothing there. So it was kind of like the cat was like warming up to me. And you can actually, you can actually smell, I could smell the cat. Like it smelled like cat. And I'm like, where's the cat? Where's the cat? And um, and my friend who was with me, he was like, he was like, Sam, there are no cats here. And I, I go downstairs to talk to the owner and I'm like, are there any cats at this hotel? Is it, oh, there's a ghost cat, but there's not a cat. I'm like, oh. I had a ghost cat experience and I, I've also had ghost dogs. Like I, you can hear the chains of a dog, like kind of like running up to you. And that happened at Meecroft uh, at Lizzie Borden's later in life home mm. uh, where I had a ghost dog experience. And that was, that was beautiful too. I love that experience. Nice. Awesome. Have you had a ghost dog experience? So it's funny you mentioned that because um, when I stayed at the 1863 Inn, when I had checked out, this was in 2014, I want to say. When I had checked out, I noticed that there was a pet fee on my on my bill, and I was like, "Hey, why is there a pet fee here? I I don't have a pet." And initially, they're like, "Oh, well, you know, that's just for uh, you know, that's we just put that in as incidentals. It'll drop off your bill. You'll get a refund for it." And a couple of weeks went by, and I noticed I still didn't get a refund, and. Uh, so I called them and I said, hey, this pet charge still hasn't fallen off. And they told me that they had it on camera that I walked into my room with a dog. What? And I was like, I don't have a dog. Like, I literally was like, <laughs> I do not have a dog. I love dogs, but I don't have a dog. And they're like, well, we have it on camera of you walking out of your car and a dog comes out of the car. And then you walk up to your room and the dog goes in the room. And I'm like, 
housekeeping came to my room. <laughs> like if I had a dog <laughs> in my room, I'm pretty sure that that would have been apparent. Now, granted, they might have been trying to talk their way out of like having to refund my pet fee. But I was like, I don't have a dog. Like it, it got to the point where I was like, OK, I need to see the security footage then because I do not have a dog. And they never sent it to me. But I just thought it was so weird that they were like, oh, we have it on camera that you have a dog. I'm like, where'd that come from? <laughs> So, so maybe you had a, a, a ghost dog experience uh, and, and you're, you were charged for it. <laughs> you know, maybe. It was just so weird. They're like, okay, well, we'll refund you this time. And I'm like, I don't have a dog. Like, it just turned into this back and forth of like, I swear I don't have a dog. Like, I didn't bring a dog with me. So, so weird. <laughs> All right, Alex, so I ask all our guests this question. If you can stay overnight at any room with a boo in the world, where would you stay? Hmm. Oh, boy. That's a good one. Um, I think <laughs> just because I'm morbidly curious, the Cecil Hotel. Me too. I want to know answer. what's going on in there. Now, having had your experience in California and kind of knowing the energy there, what do you think is going on there? Just based on, on what you've read and what you've seen. Yeah. So I've been to the Cecil. Um, I've walked into the lobby um, and this was before Elisa Lam. Um, really weird thing though, because Elisa Lam was in San Diego before she came to LA and her and I seem to have crossed paths. Like she was at the San Diego zoo the same day that I was. Um, she was in L.A. the same day that I was, and I was actually in L.A. when her body was found. So um, so I was in that area around, you know, around the Cecil, um, right around the time that she would have been staying there. And that place, that area is like the energy in L.A. and Hollywood is weird by itself. But then you, when you add in the homelessness, the drug use, the um there's a lot of nasty things happening in that particular pocket of LA. Um, like I, it's a popular place for students. It was a popular place for students to stay cause it was really, really cheap. And, um, but at what cost, you know? So I think when you combine that energy of LA and then add in, um, you know, just the, the modern dynamic of it, not even including all of the deaths that had happened there at the Cecil, the decades before, you know, um, there's just something really weird there. I don't know if it's like a crossroads of like negative energy. I'm not really on the demon train. I don't really believe in demons. Um, at least not like the modern TV definition of demons. I don't believe in it, but I do believe that areas can be like a cesspool of negative energy. And I think that might've been what was happening in there in the Cecil. Um, and apparently, I mean, I watched the Ghost Adventure special because, again, I was curious. Um, and, of course, I, I follow urban explorers that go into the Cecil. Apparently, if you give the security guard enough money, he'll let, they'll let you in. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, so from what I've been seeing, and I'm also part of an Elisa Lamb discussion group. And that's if you want to know where all the tinfoil hats hang out, that's where they're hanging out right now. Um <laughs> There's a lot of weird stuff in that in that area. There's a lot of strange things in that area. And uh, I would love to know what's going on. Um, I'd love I would love to know what's going on in that area. So all right. So speaking of Elisa Lamb, and since you are on the message boards about her, like tell people if they don't know the case. I mean, it's been on several documentaries, it's been talked about uh, through various paranormal groups, but who who was she and what happened to her? Yeah, so Elisa Lam was a um, a college student. She was a Canadian college student. And the thing I want to emphasize here, the poor girl was dealing with a lot of mental health issues. I think we have bipolar disorder. I think she had some, I think schizophrenia was in there too. There was a lot going on with her uh, mental health wise. And she was on medication and she basically wanted to go on a trip by herself. And her family agreed to it as long as she checked in every day. And so... I think she flew to, well, she flew to San Diego and then she went to the zoo. She stayed in San Diego for a few days and then took the train up to LA and stayed at the Cecil hotel. Um, 
And there's some theories out there, which if you read her Tumblr seems to support this, that she stopped taking her medication or she started to reduce how much medication she was taking to fully experience California. And uh, yeah, I mean, anyone who has seen that famous video of her, you know, like doing like all this stuff around the elevator and she went missing. She went missing um, the, day, the, the, the day before she was supposed to check out. She was originally sharing a room with some girls, but they weren't comfortable with some of the things she was doing. So she was moved to a room by herself. We saw the elevator video, which was on the 14th floor, I think. She was staying on the fifth floor. It's like, why was she on the fifth? Why was she on the 14th floor if she's on the fifth floor? She was missing for several weeks. And then several of the hotel's guests were reporting like the water was brown. It tasted funny. Um, you know, police had done a search for her, but the police were also very limited on resources because there was a murder happening. There was a murder spree happening or some something was happening where police resources were being redirected to this other case. Um, Elisa Lamb was finally found in the water tank of the Cecil Hotel, which explains why the water was weird, looked weird and tasted weird. Um, I'm sorry, if I say the water is brown or discolored, I don't drink it. Like, come on. Um, <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> pay 99 cents for a bottle of water. Just, um, so, but yeah, she was found completely naked in the water tank. Her clothes were in the water tank with her. Um, there was a lot of theories going on that she was murdered. Um, I'm more on the theory that she was having a breakdown and she had got, she maybe thought someone was chasing her. She went into the water tank. Um, the way hypothermia works, I mean, and this is, this was winter, February winter in California. Yeah, it's California, but we still get cold. It's still cold, you know? Um, so I think it might've been in like the 50s, 60s um, at night. Went into the water tank, theorizing that she probably got cold or started to freak out about drowning. Took off her clothes while she was because she thought they were weighing her down. That's I I think it's completely explainable through a mental health issue. But some people are thinking like murdered or the, there was demons after her. Um, I think that whole event definitely devastated L.A. in a different way because it's like okay, someone died happens in L.A. all the time. But I think that particular case between the elevator video and her history of mental health issues and how she was found, I think that has left a scar um, in that area, a, quite a deep scar. It's one of those cases that we keep talking about over and over and over again. And I think that because of the footage, because of sort of the mis the mystery surrounding this case, it's something that, you know, they've, they've done full-blown documentaries on it and they still don't know what really happened yeah, it's 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 tragic. I mean, I know her family tried to file a wrongful death suit against the hotel. They lost. They lost that case. Um, yeah, there's a lot of documentaries on it. Um, I mean, within like a month, there was a documentary on Netflix. There was a special on Ghost Adventures. Um, there's there's a lot happening, and I think they're still renovating that hotel because I think they're going to open it up to the public again. Uh, I mean, if that's the case, I might make the trip and go. Um, but I feel like if I go too early, it's going to be saturated by a lot of like ghost, amateur ghost hunters, urban explorers. And, you know, it's going to be a lot of like, oh my gosh, we have to see everything. So I don't know. I might wait. I might wait a little bit, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that whole thing. I mean, and I don't know for sure. I mean, there are a lot, a lot of people, especially in the Elisa Lamb groups on Facebook, a lot of people still think that she was murdered and I'm kind or that somebody at the Cecil was in on it. And I'm kind of like, eh, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's because I have a family member with mental health issues. Um, and I've seen that same behavior from them. That's one of those, like, especially the, the hand thing and, um, being really paranoid. And I mean, I've seen, I've seen that from a family member. So yeah. So if you are able to investigate the Hotel Cecil, what would you do first? Would you want to sort of reconnect with Elisa or do you feel like that, that her death is too soon to connect with her spirit? I think it's too soon. Um, I think I would open the floor. I would hate to think that she's trapped there. 
that's probably the one thing about the Ghost Adventures episode that I really kind of wasn't comfortable with was um, that she's trapped there. I I hope she's moved on. I hope she's moved on, and I hope I get wait, radio silence. I mean, I'll open the floor, but I really hope I get silence because if she's still there, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, so probably um, I would also try to talk to like anything in human that might be around. Not to say demon. I just I think there's something else happening there. I think I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some sort of like thought form or a tulpa has manifested there from the years and years of things that have happened and then who knows what richard ramirez the, the serial killer who knows what richard ramirez did when he was staying there <laughs> you know um although what his definition of like satanism and satan worship wasn't really accurate at all it was like just making signs and symbols for no reason um but that mess has to go somewhere so uh yeah i i would also open the floor to you know who else is here? What else is here? Let's talk. I'm interested. And I find it, the whole idea of uh, thought forms and tulpas and egregores very fascinating. I actually think it comes up a lot in my discussions. And so if people don't know what that is exactly, what is a thought form, Alex? So this is my personal definition of a thought form. Um, it's basically when you... <sighs> I don't want to say immense concentration, but, you know, like, say we have a haunted location and it's like, oh, there's a little girl named Sally that haunts this building. You tell that story enough and you get enough people thinking about it, you kind of manifest Sally <laughs> on your own. Um, and that wasn't a dig at the Sally house, I swear. I just, Sally just in my mind. Um, <laughs> you know, um but I feel like when you tell enough stories and you tell it enough times and it's and it, rem, and it resonates with people long enough, it kind of just forms its own ghost type of thing. It's like with the Philip experiment, you know, you had a group of people concentrating quite heavily for several years and then they finally manifested a ghost. Um, I feel like some of the ghosts in Gettysburg might be thought forms too, um, especially with Rosa Carmichael um, at the orphanage. I hope Absolutely. she's a thought form. I hope she's a thought form because she she scares the bejesus out of me, whether she's a person or a thought form. So she's 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 the one. She's anyone's like, hey, what are you afraid of? That's that's the one. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I think um, so. That's that's my that's my definition of a thought form. If you put enough like thought and energy into it, in the case of the Cecil Hotel, I think it's more of uh, you know you had. I mean, it's basically, it was a halfway house, pretty much. I mean, you have homeless people living there, um, drug people doing drugs there, um, abusing themselves, abusing others. People were murdered at the Cecil Hotel. People ended their lives at the Cecil Hotel. I just think when you put all of that really negative, tortured energy in one place, and it really has no place to go, it just kind of moves around in circles, um, I think that could form something. So that's just my theory. So, Alex, it's been great chatting with you on Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrusis. If people want more information, uh, where do they go? Yeah, if you want to learn more information about me, you can go to alexmetsuo.com. That has all my, all my uh, videos, my blogs, uh, my books. I j I'm releasing a book October 2021 about my experience with... Uh, with the spirit attachment that I picked up at a hospital and the story was actually featured on haunted hospitals. So this is like the expanded version of the experience, you know, filling in any holes or plot plot holes or gaps there. If people have questions about things. So that's coming out October, 2021. And Alex, what's the name of the book? Cause I, I totally want to read, check out this book. Yeah. It's called one bed over a hospital haunting. Awesome. So, Alex, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and we will uh, check in with you next time on Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrus. So have a great night, everybody. So thank you guys for joining Dana and myself on the, the Salem edition of Haunted Hotels with Sam Baltrusis. I hope you all have a wonderful night, and when you check in, make sure you check out of the hotel. Thank you, and have a great night.
My Paranormal Network.